had a great time. It was a, it was a long month and it was a short month. It uh, went very quickly, but uh, we got a lot accomplished. Amen. And so we got some, some good testimonies and things going on over there, but the word has been advanced and the people have been encouraged and established, so we're going to see some awesome things coming out of that. We'll talk a bit more about it a little bit later on. Now, but this morning, turn with me in your Bibles. We're going to go to a couple of places. <clears throat> the, um, <clears throat> my mandate, commission, job, whatever you want to call it, <clears throat> is to equip the saints so that, number one, they can, be, they can live a life above defeat, they can live victoriously, and they can pass it on to others. That is my purpose in life. My, my purpose is to equip the church, very honestly. My heart is for the church, and that means the entire body of Christ. And so as we go around, we see a lot of different things going on, and even here locally at times we see things happening that help me to know where we need to adjust. And so, or I wouldn't even say adjust. No, actually a better word would be that we need to pinpoint <clears throat> and to highlight and so that's really what I'm doing today. Um, I'm going to give you a scripture that I very honestly hate to say this, but I have found very few Christians that actually believe it. And so we're going to talk about it, and we're going to get you to believe in it, because you need to believe it. Amen? Amen. So turn with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. <clears throat> and this is after the 70 had come back in. Excuse me, and had um, they were giving great reports to Jesus, and they said that even the devils were subject to, to them through his name, and he responded to them. And so, we want to <clears throat> emphasize this this morning. Number it's uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 19. He says. Behold, I give unto you power, authority, to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power, the ability of the enemy. Let me repeat that last part. And over all the power, the ability of the enemy. That means there is no power, no ability that the enemy has that you don't have power over in Christ, right? Now, we're going to look at this today, and I want you to really, uh, we're going to be hitting this pretty strong, so I want you to get a hold of it. He says, and the last part is the part that I was talking about earlier, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing. That means nothing. That means not most things. That means nothing. You got that? Now, um, <clears throat> one of the main questions we get all over the world is, what if I'm casting out a devil and it tries to jump on me? Or what, how do I keep it from jumping on me when I cast it out of someone? Well, uh, first off, okay, if you're casting it out, let's say it this way. If it doesn't want to go and you have the ability to cast it out, then that's because you have an understanding and a lifestyle. Did you hear that? An understanding and a lifestyle <clears throat> that that thing would not want to be with you. Right? It's not going to jump on you if, you're, if you have an understanding and a lifestyle that allows you to exercise the name of Jesus in faith with the power behind that name that will cast that thing out. Now, secondly, if your lifestyle, now you may have an, somewhat of an understanding, but if your lifestyle is not conducive to remaining devil-free, then if that thing jumps out of them it's not be, and onto you, it's not because you cast it out, it's because you look like a better home. Just let that sit for a second. <laughs> so, yeah. But the Bible says, Jesus himself said, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And, and now get this. And he says here, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, we're going to start drilling in on this because... We see a lot of Christians that, one way or another, uh, the devil is hurting them. And that ain't right. It's not God's will. It is not in his word that he ever wants a 
devil to bother you or in any form attack you in that sense. Now, I'm not saying the devil won't attack, but you can live free. Now, get this. You can't necessarily always stop him from attacking, but you can live in a place where his attacks do not affect you and they do not, uh, it, it can actually get to a point where you don't even notice them. Why? Because your shield of faith has taken all of the darts that gets fired at you. And it's funny because a lot of times other people will notice it more than you do. And they'll say, well, what's going on here? What's that? And you're just kind of like, I'm just, just going on, you know? Well, what about that problem? Oh, that's not a big deal. And to them it would be. Why? Because people are not always used to fighting and winning. And so, first off, <clears throat> you need to get into you <clears throat> this aspect that Jesus has given you authority. Why? Because he went to the Father. Not because, now understand, just a minute ago I talked about a lifestyle. I'm not talking about works in the sense of you deserving to live free. I'm talking about <clears throat> a lifestyle in which you recognize the freedom and authority that Jesus gave you and you live accordingly. Okay? Now, <clears throat> because your life has to reflect by action what you say you believe. If what you say you believe does not match your lifestyle, you don't believe what you say you believe. Your lifestyle shows what you believe. It's that simple. Now, we're going to be looking at a lot of different things, uh, especially over the next few weeks, <clears throat> that uh, I know that we need to bring out. And one of those, we're going to be looking very in-depth at what it means to remain not lukewarm. Lukewarm is the worst place you can be. It's the only place where Jesus said he will spew you out of his mouth. So, I don't know, I, okay, people have all kinds of ideas about salvation, different things, but spewed out of his mouth doesn't sound like the place you want to be, right? And so, lukewarm is not it. Now, I, I will tell you, I've never met a person yet that when we started talking about their spirituality, they go, well, you know, I'm lukewarm right now, but, you know. It's amazing. It, they've no, nobody's ever told me that. And so they always say, you know, like, as a matter of fact, they'll avoid it altogether, or they will say, they're, oh, yeah, I'm on fire for God. Okay, well, when? Just while you're, you know, between the beginning of the service and the end of service? <clears throat> because the rest of the time, your life doesn't match that. If your life doesn't look the same all the time, then you're a phony and a hypocrite. Good morning. <laughs> I don't know how much plainer I can get, right? And listen, just because you're doing something for God, <clears throat> you say for God, doesn't mean that God looks at it as though it's for him, right? There are people that worship, and they worship in vain, Jesus said. Think about that. We have this idea that we can do whatever we want, and we can call it worship and give it to Jesus, and he'll take it. Not true. There are specific ways that he said you can come to him. There are specific ways that he said that you can abide with him. And if you're not doing those, you're not with him. All right? Now, again, I'm not talking about just works. I'm, I'm not saying you're saved by works. I'm saying that your light shines by your works after you're saved, and people can tell whether your light is red hot or ice cold or lukewarm. But most of the time we see ourselves as on fire when many times we're not. It's mainly because we compare ourselves to somebody else, and it's amazing how we always look for the ones that are definitely cold to compare ourselves to so we can look better. So, James chapter 4. James chapter 4, starting in verse 1. He says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? In other words, a lot of times how you, now understand, you can have enemies, and, but it's just because you have enemies. Listen, you can have an enemy and you do nothing wrong. They can be an enemy because they don't like what you're doing right. Right? Now, that ain't what they tell people, but that's a lot of times the way it is. But you can have an enemy when you're doing nothing wrong, and the enemy will still be an enemy to you. But how you respond to that enemy shows what's in you. How you respond to people, how you do certain things with people, interact with people, that kind of stuff, shows what's in you. And that's why he says, well, why are you having wars and fights, fightings among you? Why? He said, that's because it's in you to have wars and fights. 
The Bible says very clearly that we're to live in peace with all men as much as is in us. So you will live in peace as much as is in you. Now, he says here, verse 2, you lust and have not. You kill. Wow, that's strong. You kill. Well, we know that the word kill here, and according to Jesus, he says even if you don't like somebody, you're the same as a murderer. And so he says, you, you lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. Look at verse 4. He doesn't cut any slack here. He says, you adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity or hostility toward God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Okay, I'm going to repeat that. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. And what's he saying there? He says that spirit that dwells in you, the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. Notice he says he dwells in them. Lusteth to envy. What's he doing? Why is he lusting to envy? In other words, he's saying he wants to have the, the influence and control in your life that you are giving to other things. He wants to have that influence. Why? Because especially if you're a friend of the world, says, if you're a friend of the world, you're going to let the world dictate what you think, how you think, what you say, how you live, and you're going to compare yourself to the world. Michael Brown says the world's about 20 years, or the church is about 20 years behind the world. That used to be true. Now it's about three. Why? Because you can't really tell the church different from the world. And so you can tell by how they live. <clears throat> you can tell by the movies they watch. You can tell by the different things, how they talk. But beloved, I can tell you that Jesus is coming after a pure and holy church. Right? And that doesn't mean somebody just standing there yelling grace is pure and holy. It ain't the saying of grace, it's living under grace. And grace doesn't give you the right to live in sin, it gives you the ability to live above it. That's what grace does in you. It changes your heart and causes you to want to live right. Now, he says... <clears throat> In verse uh, 6, yeah. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Now, I don't have time to go into this today, but we will in the very near future. But verse 7, and this is, this is the essence of what I want to get to this morning. <clears throat> because if we get a hold of this, we'll go back to Luke 10, 19, and, and we'll be different there. Verse 7 says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You got that? Now, let's take that just real, and we're going to move on here. But I want you to see this. Verse 7, first, before resisting the devil, you must submit yourself to God. If you don't submit yourself to God, you cannot resist the devil. And if you don't resist the devil, he will not flee from you. So the first key here is to submit yourself unto God. Now, the main way, now understand, there's obviously when you get born again, you make Jesus Lord of your life. And, well, if you really make him Lord of your life, then you are submitting your will to God's will. And not just at that moment, but from then on. You make him actually Lord of your life. Therefore, you will do what he says. But now, understand here that when it says submit yourselves to God, that does not mean to submit yourself to some arbitrary idea or voice in your head. It literally means to submit yourself to his word. Why? Because his word is his will. And if you submit yourself to him, you cannot say, I'm submitted to this person and not be submitted to their word or their will. It is impossible. So if you're going to submit yourself to God, you're going to submit yourself to his word, and you're going to begin doing his word and obeying his word, right? Now, he says, 
First, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Okay, what does that do? That actually go, takes you back to verse 6, because he says he gives more grace. He resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So if you submit yourself to God, you're humbling yourself. See, you are humbling yourself when you submit yourself to God and to his word. And that, that, that ability to humble yourself is you saying, you know what? You, more than, you know more than I do. I know what I'm feeling. I know what I'm thinking. But I also know that you know more than I do. So just because I'm feeling something, I'm going to assume now I'm going to submit myself under, under what you said. And I'm going to take what you said over what I feel. That, that's called submitting. Okay? So that means whenever your body is saying one thing, but the scripture, God said, by his stripes you were healed, what do you say? See, to submit yourself, you have to go along with God and go, you know what? I know what my body feels, but God said, by his stripes I'm healed. Therefore, I'm submitting myself to his word, and you stand on that. And when you do that, your body will have to change. It's just that simple. Now, I don't know why a lot of people think that there's some secret, there's some magical secret about walking with God and walking in his ability to keep you well. I don't know why we think that, other than people just listen to too much Christian television. So, well, that's still better than listening to the other stuff, generally speaking. <clears throat> but the other stuff, they just call God names. On Christian television, they actually lie about it. So, okay, let's move on. All right, he says here, now watch. Now, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Next statement, resist the devil. Resist him, right? Now, I'm going to clarify some of the things as we go. But first off, it says resist. Notice it doesn't say overcome him. Why? Because he's already overcome. Man. He's already defeated, Right? Now, you have to understand, he is not looking for a fight. He is looking for a walkover. He's looking for somebody that when he shows up, they will bow the knee, and he wants to devour them. So he's not looking for a fight. He's not looking for somebody that will actually put up resistance. Now, notice what it says. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, that's pretty simple, isn't it? So now here's the thing. If you resist, he will flee. Now, turn that around. If he has not fled, you have not resisted. You got that? Because he said, if you resist, he will flee. He didn't say, if you resist, and then you finally defeat him. No. He says, if you resist. Okay? Let's look at it this way. If the devil comes to your house and tries the door and it's locked, he'll go to the next house. Why? He's not looking to break into a house. He's looking for an open door. Does that make sense? So all you got to do is make sure that your doors are locked. It's just that simple. Right? How do, you, how do you get your doors locked? Well, you believe the word, you speak the word, you live accordingly. It's that simple. When you do that, <clears throat> you give him no place, and he cannot get into your life. Now, he can try to attack, but if he tries to attack, you resist. And actually, I, I believe that this is going to actually go over into the 10 o'clock session also, because we're, we're, there's some specific things I want to ask uh, and I think it'll help clarify some things as we move forward in this. Because my job is not to give you a neat little sermon. My job is to equip you. It is to get you to a place where you can live victorious. Amen? Now, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> All right, now. <coughs> I was on a plane last, well, yesterday, <coughs> for about 21 hours altogether, and the air there is thin, <laughs> so <coughs> voice is a little rough, plus I've been preaching almost every day for the last month, <coughs> so bear with me. Now, he says here, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, okay, now listen carefully. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. You got that? Doesn't say draw nigh, and he'll be somewhere off over there, and you got to call on him and call on him and try to get him to show up. It says if you draw nigh, he will draw nigh. Right there? You get that? Now, that doesn't mean if I take a step, he'll take a step, and yet we're still miles apart. That means I take a step, and he's zip right there. 
I'm drawing nigh, he draws nigh. You got that? Now, if you're born again, now get this. People say, well, how can we be born again and him dwell in us, and yet we still are distanced and we have to draw nigh? Uh, two people could live in the same house and be distances apart, right? So just because you live in the same house doesn't mean you're in close proximity, okay, and everything else. And so you have to realize here that when he says draw nigh to him, he's not talking about distance. He's talking about in relationship and knowing that he is with you and you being with him. And you, because notice this is all, you have to take all of this in context that he is talking about submitting yourself to him. So how do you draw nigh to him? Again, by submitting yourself to him, by submitting yourself to his word. Listen, everybody likes to hang around people that like to talk about the things they like to talk about. God is the same way. He loves to, to hang around people that want to talk about things that he has talked about, right? He doesn't want to hang around people, and I'm not saying he's going to leave you or anything else. I'm just saying don't expect him to participate in your conversations if your conversations don't include something or are based around the word of God in some way. And you say, well, you mean that's, that's all I'm supposed to talk about? If you can, if that's possible, yeah. Now, if, while you're at work, you might not be able to quote scripture constantly to everybody in the middle of your business meeting. But it should still be in your mind of how to do things in alignment with the word of God. And if you have the wisdom of God, which you do because you have Jesus, you have that in you, you can sit in a business meeting and actually he will give you ideas that will make the business run better and prosper just because you're there. God, God is so much bigger than most of us think that he is. So he says here, draw nigh to God. He will draw nigh to you. Now look what he says. Here's part of drawing nigh. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, isn't that amazing? He says to purify your hearts, you double-minded. That means if you're double-minded, you have a heart problem. Do you get that? He says to purify your hearts, you double-minded. Why? Because you're, what you're doing is you're having two minds. One is your heart and one is your mind. And you're, com you're, you're having this conflict between the two. And it's mainly because usually your mind is not renewed to the Word of God, so therefore you have not aligned it with the Word of God, so you end up having a struggle between the two. Now he says here, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Now isn't that just the opposite of what we usually hear? But this is what the Apostle James is writing here. And he says, be afflicted, mourn, weep, let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Why? Because here he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify our hearts, you double-minded. So he said, because you're double-minded, because you're living in sin or practicing sin, he says, you should weep and mourn and understand and be afflicted in that sense. Because being afflicted, that actually uh, is one of the words used for fasting. Now, here he didn't say fast, but when he says be afflicted, the way they afflicted their soul was through fasting. So he's telling them, look, do what you've got to do to get the stuff out of your life, the weight and the sin, cleanse your hands, you sinners, that so easily besets us. Get this stuff out of your life. Well, you know, I just can't. Stop right there. God said you can, so you can. End of story. Let's change your wording. You don't want to. Because you can do whatever you want to do because God is right there to help you change. If you're caught in sin, it's because you like the sin. You go, well, that's not true. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. what? I'm going I'm to believe the Bible over you. Okay, it's just that simple. He says when you're drawn away, you're drawn away of your own lust. You don't get drawn away by stuff you don't like. So your key is to kill the stuff that Jesus doesn't like. Amen? Amen? So he says here, <clears throat> humble, verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. And you notice all these are, if you do this, he'll do that. If you do this, he'll do that. You draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to you. You humble yourself, he will exalt you. He will lift you up. Isn't that right? See, there's this thing in Christianity today that we want to put everything under this idea that we have to do nothing. Why? And if we talk about doing something, oh, he's, in, he's talking about salvation by works. Nope. I'm talking about works by salvation. You get to do the things of God. You get, it's amazing. The people that want to 
not talk about works. Want to do the works of Jesus. And Jesus called, he said, the same works that I do shall he do also and greater works. Imagine that. And yet people, oh, we, oh, we don't want to talk about works. We're, not, we're going to talk about works. Why? Because faith without works is dead. See, these are the things people don't like to talk about because they want to live an easy life and they want all the blessings. There is a spirit of entitlement that has come into the church that we got to get rid of. Why? Let me tell you, you're not entitled to anything that Jesus has given you. You, now you understand what I'm saying by this? You have access to it. But don't, listen, the reason you have access is because you're in him and he's in you and you're walking with him. You got that? You walk outside of him, you deserve, well, you don't want what you deserve. Let's put it that way. Amen? That's why we have mercy. And then we got born again. If you get born again, he changes your life and he puts in you to do right. And if you don't have in you to do right, you are not born again. It is that simple, which can be remedied real quick as soon as we can break your will, because that's what has to be done. Amen? He says here, <clears throat> Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. You see, right now, <clears throat> most people say, well, that's good. I'm not a, I'm not a doer of the law. Uh, yeah, that's what the Bible is very clear, that the righteousness of the law is in us to be able to do that righteousness now be, by faith in Jesus Christ. He gives us the ability to obey the law. That is the purpose of getting born again, so that the law could be lived out through your life, but not in the sense of, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, and I'm checking off the list. It, why? What does that mean? <clears throat> See, the reason you couldn't keep the law before was because your nature wasn't right with God. Your nature was of Satan as a sinner. That's the way it was. When you come to Christ, your nature is transformed by righteousness and now you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You are the righteousness. You get that? You don't have righteousness. You are the righteous. Why? Because you've been made righteous, and now your nature is righteous, and he that does righteousness is righteous. You get that? Why? Because you know, when you're born again, your nature is changed, and now he's put a different heart in you, a different nature in you. And the only problems you have are the problems that you want to keep on having it because you don't want to turn loose of the hand of the world to hang on to the hand of God. That's really what it comes down to. Now, <clears throat> which that is the power of the gospel. It gives you the ability to actually have your heart changed so that you like good instead of evil. Now, he says here, verse 12, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy, who art thou that judges another? Go to now, you that say today or tomorrow will go to such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get game, <clears throat> whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, now listen, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the essence of this, I want to show you because, it, you know, the idea here is this. If you resist the devil, he will flee. And like I said, if he hadn't fled, it's because you hadn't resisted. So there has to be just the resistance you understand? And so, but to have that resistance, you have to submit yourself to God and under his hand and under his word and under his will. Now, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13 says, But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Then he goes right on into chapter 2 and says, Therefore, <clears throat> because of that, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. One of the problems in the church today is that we expect a new sermon every Sunday. 
many times when we haven't done the last one. And we have to realize that our lives are to be built upon the rock, not just sitting on the rock, but built upon the rock. What is the rock? The rock is the words of Jesus, according to Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. Our lives are to be built on that rock of his words and of doing his words. Now, he says in verse, so that, what that means is very simply this. There are times whenever you can hear a sermon after sermon after sermon, and you forget what the first one was, and you've not done what the first one said you should do, and yet you're still trying to build, and you don't have a foundation. Why? Because you're going back and forgetting the things that you let slip. He says, verse 2, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, in other words, you got punished if you didn't keep them, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come. Stop right there. What does that mean? That means, now notice he said, not unto the angels. Who is the world to come put in subjection to? Us, believers, through Jesus Christ. It's really put under him, and because we're in him, it's put under us. He says here, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak, but one in a certain place. Well, what place is this? Psalm 8. <clears throat> so we could say that. But, but one in Psalm 8 said, testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that you visit him? Then he answers the question. You made him a little lower, and the King James here says angels, but the original Hebrew of Psalm 8 says God. You made him a little lower than God. You crowned him with glory and honor, and did set him, man, over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, notice he's talking about man. Then he says his feet. So it is talking about man, but it's talking about a particular man named Jesus Christ. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. What are they saying? It almost sounds like a contradiction. But he says, listen, all things are put under his feet. In other words, everything is under his feet. What does that mean? That goes back to Genesis chapter 1. When God gave man dominion over the earth. Adam blew it. So God's plan had to include a new man that wouldn't mess it up. And so he sent Jesus. And now all of the earth is put under his feet. All authority in heaven and earth are in him. And now he says, but yet we don't see everything put under his feet. In other words, legally, everything has been declared to be under Jesus' feet. In other words, Jesus has absolute authority over everything, but everything is not obeying him yet. So everything's under his feet legally, but yet not experientially. In other words, things are not yet under his feet. So there's still rebellion against him. Now watch, he goes on, he says, but now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels, okay? For, again, the word for God there would have been the same thing. For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, showing that he was that original man, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him, in other words, good for him. He, he agreed with it. For whom are all things and by whom are all things. In other words, everything that is made was made for him and by him in bringing many sons unto glory. Many sons. That's us. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings, for both he that sanctifies or sets apart and they that are set apart are all of one. For which cause, now get this, since we are all of one, he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Imagine that. Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brethren. Why? Why? because we have been sanctified and set apart in him. Saying, now here's what he says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. 
in the midst of the church, or the assembly, will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God has given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. He became flesh and blood because we're flesh and blood. Just so that he could experience what we have experienced. Now watch, because he goes on, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Now is that simple or not? That when Jesus died, he destroyed the power, destroyed him that had the power of death which is the devil. So the devil has been destroyed. In other words, totally defeated and rendered basically harmless. And understand that if you walk in Christ where you're supposed to walk. Now, he says here, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject unto bondage. You hear what brings bondage? Fear of death. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He did not come in the form of an angel. He came in the form of a man, specifically the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted... He is able to succor them that are tempted. In other words, he knows what it feels like to be tempted. But guess what? He didn't fall. Now, guess what? You also have that same spirit. You notice the spirit came upon him before he went out to be tempted. Is that right? And because of the power of the spirit, he was able not to fall to that temptation. That's the spirit you have. You have the spirit in you that can keep you from falling to temptation. Do you get that? What does that mean? That means that whenever you're attempted, that spirit in you lusteth against the flesh and goes, no, 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 no. I want your attention. I want your influence. Don't look at that. Don't think about that. Don't do this. I want your attention. The spirit lusteth against the flesh and to envy. So he said, no, listen to me. But at that time, if now understand, you're being tempted by what you like. And so at the same time, the Spirit's going, no, 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 think on this, Go, think on these things. See, you can't think on these things, like he said in Philippians 4, and remain tempted. You can't do it. You can't think about Jesus and the sin at the same time. So the moment you're thinking about the sin, the moment you're being tempted, he's trying to attack, okay? And that, now understand, being tempted is not sin. You can be tempted and not sin. Jesus was tempted and didn't sin. Amen? So, but now the same spirit that was in Jesus that helped him, strengthened him, and allowed him not to sin is the same spirit that is in you. So, what am I saying? I'm saying you have no excuse if you sin. It's because you choose to. Amen? So you have to decide which voice you're going to listen to. Now, I'm going to go quickly and finish up here. Why are we talking about this? Because I want you to realize that if you resist, if you just put up resistance, the enemy will flee from you. Now, I know I'm repeating this a lot, but you've got to get this. If you, listen, if you resist him, he will flee from you. If he did not flee, you have not resisted. All right? Now, 1 John 4.4, 4, let me finish up with this. 1 John 4.4 4 says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because... Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, that's a statement of fact. The one in you is greater than those that are in the world and the he that's in the world. You got that? What does that mean? Now, think about that. That means that if you go the way of the world, quote, unquote, sin, if you practice sin, live in sin, think about sin, if you're tempted and you go into the temptation, you are shutting down the voice and you are not being strong in the power of the Lord and in his might. You are purposely, understand this, you are purposely deciding not to hear his voice and to ignore his voice because I'm telling you, when you're being tempted, you just might not hear it. Why? Because the voice of the tempter might be pretty loud, but there's a voice in you going, no, mm -mm, don't do this. Look at this. Talk about this. Think about this. And so you have to make that decision to actually push away the temptation. That's called resistance. When you resist, 
Not when you sit there and go, no, 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 I'm not going to. And then you start talking about whatever it is. No, the more you talk about it, the more likely you are to do it. The more you think about it, why? Because what you think about, you do. So you have to turn your attention. But we, looking to Jesus. So what do we do? We turn our attention to him. Whatever it takes, whatever you got to do at that moment. That's why he says, flee youthful lust. Flee these things. It's not a matter of just, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to stand. No, no, no. You don't stand. You flee. Do you get that? You resist, but you flee. Get away from it, right? Whatever it is, change scenery, change something, whatever it is you got to change, but you change it so that you can get your mind focused back on things that are above. Why? Because I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. So all of this goes together, but that is on your part. But the, the point of today is this. You submit yourself unto God. You resist the devil, he will flee. End of story. So if you, you are living the type of life you want to live. And let me tell you, many of the problems that you face on a daily basis are because of where you keep your mind, which actually opens the door to the enemies bringing different types of things to you. Now listen, all temptation is, uh, okay, let me put it this way. All temptation is a temptation to sin. But all sin is not the same in the sense of how it comes or what shape it takes, right? In other words, when people think sin, people have kind of a list. Everybody has, I guess, a different list. But some of the lists are pretty close to the same. But you just have to think in terms of what it, because it could be all kinds of things that what, what might not be a, I want to word this just right, but in other words, the longer you walk with God and the closer you walk with God, the smaller the breach is towards sin. Does that make sense? In other words, things, smaller things can be a big deal to you. Why? Because if you walk with God long and you've been walking with him, then you know, you're not going to get into the <clears throat> big sins. You know, the, you know what I'm talking about, the big sins, right? You're not going to do that. Why? Because that's just not even a part of you anymore. But he'll try to get you in other areas. He'll, he'll try to tempt you to get in a fight with somebody. He'll try to tempt you with somebody in a store somewhere that smarts off to you and you want to just, you know, put them in their place, <clears throat> you know? And your flesh goes, yeah, that felt good. And as soon as you get the flesh behind, then the spirit of that going, no, mm -mm. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah. You know, okay, Father, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead and tell them that. I'm not that sorry. I just, I'm just sorry. I just want forgiveness. I just, I'm just, I just want forget. I'm just forgiveness. Sorry. That's how sorry I am. He said, no. He says no. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Why? And you think, well, it was just a little, you know, just it, no. Why? Because <clears throat> listen. The closer you get to purity, the bigger the small specks stand out. That's why Jesus said, why are you so concerned about the log in your brother's eye when you've got a little bitty speck in your own eye? He said, no, no, no. Get that little speck out before you go tackle the big log. Isn't that right? But see, the closer you walk with God, the more, the more you want. Because see, when you have his spirit, you want to be pure. You want to walk holy. You want to live in that constantly. But at the same time, and, and it doesn't take much for that little speck. Why? Because you can, you can see that log a long ways off. <clears throat> but when you take that speck and put it right here, guess what? It's right there too. And it looks a lot bigger. You got to actually look around it to see their log. Why? Because you got the speck in your eye. So the key is getting it out of your eye first. In other words, Getting these things out, resisting the devil, whatever, whatever way, there's all kinds of ways, and I don't have time today to go into all of it, but it, there's all kinds of ways that he will just try, little, little things here and there that break down resistance. Even the term breaks down resistance, you know? One of the reasons I've never been, listen, this, listen carefully, one of the reasons, and especially now, I'm 64 years old, I've never tasted alcohol. You know why? You know why it's so easy? Because I've never tasted alcohol. Why? Because I never broke that. See, the, every time you break that area, it gets easier to do it the next time. 
And pretty soon, it's not even a thing anymore. He says, yeah, there's no problem. You know, and my parents owned a bar. When I was 15, 16 years old, my parents owned a bar. I could have got in there and drank any time. My aunt ran it for them. I could have drank any time I wanted to. She would have given it to me. She was that kind of aunt. Kind you don't need, okay? <laughs> but I'd go down and play pool, but I never touched alcohol. Why? Because whenever I was nine, I made a vow, and I killed that thing. And I, I've never, I mean, there's never even been a temptation. Why? Because I hate it. To this day, I hate alcohol in any form, in any degree. I don't care. I don't even like using real wine for communion. Why? Because it does no good. It does no, there's, there's no reason to. Right? Why? Because I hate that stuff. Because I saw what it did. And see, be, now, there were a lot of other areas. I, there was a lot of other things I wished I'd have hated too. But then I didn't hate them. All right? And guess what? Those were the ones I did. So there's this correlation between liking it and doing it and hating it and not doing it. And the key is you've got to crucify the lust of the flesh. And if you're his, you have done that, the Bible says. Amen? Now, I've got to stop. I'm going over here. <clears throat> but I'll read this real quick, and then we'll go from there. Yep, read real quick. Romans chapter 8, verse 34 says, Who is he that condemns? <clears throat> it is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Then in verse 37, nay, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now understand, <clears throat> you will never be separated from the love of Christ. Never. You got that? Now, and guess what else? There are people in hell that God loves. His love doesn't get separated from them, but their sin has separated them from him, he said. And because of their life, they go to hell, he still loves them. And it hurts him to see them go to hell. But people say, well, see, nothing can separate us so I can live any way I want. That's the mind of a person who has not been born again. Why? Because sin killed Jesus. You should hate it in all forms. Philippians 4, verse 11 says, Now, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. See, we quote that all the time. Go, I can do all things. I can do all things. And we use it for everything except the things that it was, he was actually talking about. Because what was he saying? I can do all things. How? I have learned to be content in whatever state I'm in. What does that mean? That doesn't mean that if you're poor, you have to remain poor. He's not talking about that. If you're sick, you've got to remain sick. He's not talking about that. He's saying, I have learned that no matter what I go through, there's ups and there's downs, but guess what? I'm going to stay the same. Why? Because Christ strengthens me to go through things, not to remain in them, but to go through them. He strengthens us through all these things, not to you know, recant or deny Christ or, well, that stuff doesn't work. No, it works. The Word of God works. But he said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me, no matter what, whether I'm abounding or whether I'm abased, as he said, and whether I'm broke or whether I'm prospering, whether I'm hungry or full, no matter what. What does that mean? How do you know when you're content? You're not constantly grumbling, murmuring, and griping. Isn't that simple? So you see a person is constantly grumbling, going on about the well, you know, this way. Okay, that is a person who is not content 
and has not learned how to do all things through Christ with strength in them. Guess what? They'll stay there. Not always in the same problem, but another problem at the same level. Why? Until they learn to shut up and lean on him, give your life to him, and let him work through you. And then it's, it gets to a point, all this has to do is, it all goes back to dying to self. Because that's what he's trying to get you to do. He's trying to get you to die to self so that, now get this, there, you know why he wants you to die to self? So that nothing can stop you. Because when you die to self, nothing can stop you. Because it's always self that rises up. Somebody talks about you, self goes, well, how dare they talk about me? And what do you do? You just moved over into the flesh. And the Spirit says, don't go there. So he wants you. He wants you to die to all of that stuff. He wants you to be able to take correction, take instruction, move forward, and do all things through Christ. And if somebody's telling you where you're wrong, you just... That's one of those times when you can do all things through Christ. You stand there and listen and go, yep, okay, I get it. And then you make the changes, and then you keep on moving forward. But you got to die to self. Because that's what Because like I said, when you die to self, nothing can stop you. Because it's self that stops you. Listen, if the devil could stop you, he would have stopped you from getting born again. He would have stopped you from doing anything. So the devil can't stop you. Only you can decide where you stop. You got that? Now, the devil can attack, he can do the stuff, but he can't stop you. He'll be right in your face the whole time, backing up, yelling at you, telling you how you're not going to make it, how you're going to go under, how God doesn't keep his word, all that kind of stuff, and you just keep on going. Why? Because you don't listen, and you just keep moving forward, and he'll keep backing up the whole time. It's amazing. Why? Because you resist him, and he'll back away from you. Amen? Now, today, we're going to be talking about your testimony, your testimony. So let's look at some scripture. You can turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We will start there. Now, first off, I also want to mention, if you're a baby Christian, uh, it better be because you're new, right? And not because you refuse to grow up, right? Uh, God is not calling me to be a babysitter. You understand? If you're here and you want to stay here, then you're here because you want to grow. You want to grow up. You want to grow up in Christ. You want to grow up into Christ. You want to grow up spiritually. And you're not looking to be a spiritual hitchhiker and let somebody else do all your stuff, right? You're supposed to be finding out how you can help other people in their stuff. And so that's one of the reasons why we do the teaching and the trainings we do. It's not just to, you know, spend time. It is to actually cause you to be able to meet the needs of people wherever they are. Now, if anything, recently, this last month, and everything has shown me even the greater need for more in-depth training and teaching and getting people uh, to be able to help people. Because it's one thing, you can train Christians, but if they don't understand that they can actually help, the fact that they know how to help, but they don't believe they can help, you got to get that out of them. you got to get it to the point where they know they can help because they've been trained, they've been equipped, and God has met their needs with whatever they need to help other people. And so, now, in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 12, it says, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation, our lifestyle, in the world and more abundantly toward you. So what's he saying? He said, our testimony, this is our rejoicing is because of our testimony, of the, the testimony of our conscience. In other words, our conscience testifies that we are living according to the word of God and that our lifestyle matches what our testimony is. Now, I mentioned this a little bit in the first session, so we're just going along with it. In verse 13, he says, for we write none other things unto you than what you read or read or acknowledge. And I trust you shall acknowledge even to the end. Now notice he's talking about testimony. Here he's talking about the conscience, and he's talking about you acknowledging something. And he says in verse 14, As also you have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing, even as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. 
In other words, he's saying, we want to know that when we stand before Jesus, your testimony, we can rejoice with you in your testimony. You can rejoice with us in our testimony. Why? Because our testimony is that our conscience is right with God, that our testimony is right. Now, understand, when we say testimony, a lot of times we think, well, this is my testimony. You know, I was this bad person, and this went on, and this happened, and we go through 45 minutes of how much the devil, how, how our lives are given to the devil, and then we top it off with, and then Jesus, and he saved me and delivered me, thank you. And that's it. And you spend 45 minutes glorifying the devil and two minutes mentioning Jesus. And so we have to realize, now that's not all we're talking about here. Your testimony, and, and it's amazing when you look at the words that, that were used in the Bible, all these words were words that had so much more to them. So when we say your testimony, see, we, there's all kinds of words for testimony. But usually the word testimony and even these words used, now think about this. The word used here for testimony is a Greek word that actually means evidence admitted into court. So your testimony, now, your test, we think of our testimony as our life, our pre-Christ life, and now Christ is in our life, that that, that is our testimony. No, no, no. Your testimony is from the day you were born and then to the day you were born again and then from that day until the day of the Lord. That is your testimony. Why? Because we are open epistles, openly read of all men. Our lives are to be epistles. Now, understand, not just letters, but epistles of God to testify of God's goodness. So your testimony is you testifying to God's faithfulness, to his goodness, to his ability and willingness to keep his word, that's your testimony. So your testimony is every time you open your mouth. Every time you open your mouth, you are testifying either to God's faithfulness or to the devil's ability in your life. Do you get that? So the words that come out of your mouth, it's not just, well, here was my life when I was with the devil, and here's my life now that I'm with Jesus. No, it is every day, what is your testimony? Why? Because your testimony will, has to match your conscience, which means your conscience has to tell your mouth what to speak, and your conscience goes back to, you talk about, well, I can say in good conscience. Paul said several times, uh, you know, I tell you the truth, my conscience verifying it. What is he saying? He said, I'm not saying anything that my conscience is going to condemn me over. In other words, I'm going to speak the truth. And so he's talking about his testimony. And when he talks about testimony in the Bible, you're going to see several different scriptures here. But your testimony is what you say every day. Not just your life history, but what you say every day. Every day when you are speaking, you have to realize that it's as if you're in court speaking and giving testimony that is going to be entered as evidence that is going to be kept on record. That's every word that comes out of your mouth. Now, I'll show you why this is so important. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 says, "Where Now, you have to remember, Paul is just talking to Timothy, and he said, I knew your mother, knew your grandmother. They had great faith. I'm sure it's in you too. And then in verse 6, he says, Wherefore? I put you in remembrance. I'm reminding you. This means he's been told this before. I'm reminding you that you stir up the gift of God, which is in the, by the putting on of my hands. Now, that gift of God is the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was the only gift ever given in the New Testament by the laying on of hands, right? So when he's talking about the gift, stirring up the gift of God in you, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, not a particular gift. But now notice also later on, he tells him to do the work of an evangelist. And yet, Timothy wasn't technically an evangelist. He was an overseer. He was a pastor. Some would even say a bishop. We, and as a matter of fact, based on the way that the New Testament's written, uh, it would even say that he was technically an apostle. So that's one of the reasons why Paul would say, do the work of an evangelist. Why? Because an apostle can do it all in that sense. They have to be able to go into a place, start something from scratch. That means they have to evangelize, then they have to teach, then they have to be able to pastor and, and oversee the people that they are teaching. 
then they have to be able to function prophetically because they have to train the people up, and then they have to function by going into all the world and continuing to advance the gospel. Now, here he says in verse 7. Now, understand, well, we'll go back to verse 6. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance of that you stir up the gift of God. Notice who stirs up the gift of God? God doesn't stir up the gift. You stir up the gift. You got that? <clears throat> Which is in thee by the putting out of my hands, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but instead the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. There in verse 8, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Don't be ashamed of the testimony. In other words, don't be ashamed of you talking about what Jesus did. Do you get that? He says, nor of me, his prisoner. Don't be ashamed to talk about the things, here he's telling Timothy, that you've seen in me, that you know of me, that you've heard from me, and even though I'm in prison, even though I'm in chains, don't be ashamed of my testimony because these chains just add to the proof that what I'm telling you is the truth. He says, but instead... Be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Isn't that amazing? He said, Don't, we, God hadn't given us a spirit of timidity or fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. That'll take you through the afflictions that come with the gospel. Okay? He says here, according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, okay? It's amazing. God didn't call you according to your works. He did not he didn't get that. He didn't call you according to your works before or after you were saved. We know he didn't call you because of what you did before you were saved. You got that? But he says, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. He looked ahead and saw it. God is a planner. He started from the beginning, and he actually in the beginning, he started by knowing the end. He planned this thing all the way through, and he called you. Why? Not because of what you were or what you were going to become, in the sense that because you weren't even here at that point. When, when he made the plans, he looked through time and saw you, saw the responses you were going to make, now get that, and said, I can use that person. But he didn't just see you at the end. He saw you what you were going to become. But he also saw who you were before you became that and still said, my grace can overcome that. My grace can work in them. And matter of fact, as bad as that person was, that'll just be a trophy of grace whenever I use that person to do this. See, never discount somebody just because of how they start. Amen? Why? Because God doesn't talk about starts. Actually, what he says about starts is, don't uh, despise the, the day of small beginnings. In other words, don't, you look at a David, and as we said before, a lot of people look at David and all they saw was a shepherd boy. God saw a king. God even knew the mistakes David was going to make, but he also knew he was going to be quick to repent. And so God can look at people and you look at people and you say, well, I, God, God could never use that person. That person could never change. This person, never. Listen, you think you're counting the person out, you're counting God out. You're saying God's not powerful enough to change that heart. God's not powerful enough to do this or change that person. And let me tell you, God loves to show you off and show you wrong. He'd love to prove you wrong when you start discounting people. Amen? So he says here, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which has given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death. So you don't have to fear death anymore, right? For you, it's just a blink. You close your eyes and you open your eyes and you're standing before him. He says, and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He's given you the opportunity for eternal life. He says here in verse 11, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, 
and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I know whom I believed, and I have committed myself to him, and I know he can keep me, and he will cause me to keep, continue moving forward until that day. He had total reliance on God. Verse 13, he says, now notice, he's still writing to Timothy. It's amazing what he put in this letter because Timothy was his closest disciple. It was his closest friend at that point. And here he says, hold fast. Because notice, he had just told Timothy all these things about what God was doing in him. But Timothy already knew these things. But notice what he said at the beginning. I'm reminding you. I don't mind reminding you again these things. And he says, hold fast the form of sound words. In other words, keep your doctrine straight. That's what we harp on around here. Keep the message pure. What is the message? The gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the message. Keep it pure. Don't mix it with a bunch of other stuff. He says, hold fast the form of sound words, which you have heard of me. In other words, say the things you've heard me say. In faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. He says, that good thing which was committed unto you, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwells in us. The thing that was committed to you, he says, keep that. How do, how do you keep it? By the Holy Ghost that dwells in you. There are things, listen, as I travel, we meet a lot of people, and, and I mean crowds and, and large crowds. And in every place we went this last time, they, everywhere we go, it's full. I mean, they, they crowd in, and a lot of times they'll say, we have this many seats, so when we get this many people registered, we have to shut it off. And as in every meeting, sometimes uh, everybody doesn't show up, but then when they let them know that there is seats available, people come in. Why? Because the Christian world wants truth. And they want to be told the truth. They want sound words. They want to know that what they've heard is the truth. And people are really desiring that truth. They're wanting to hear. They have a zeal for God, and they want to hear the truth. And it's been, what, four years now since we were there. Because uh, we were there in uh, 2019, had to go over. It was a quick trip going over. But, then, but we didn't get uh, the opportunity to really minister much while we are there. It was more organizational stuff that we had to take care of. And so in the last four years, the only contact that a lot of those people have had with us has been through Internet and watching, and the crowds are bigger than they've ever been. Why? Because they went through COVID. They went through some of the stuff that went on, and they saw the truth of it. And it's amazing because I sat around tables talking with known preachers, that pastored churches or had churches and different things, and even some that had networks of churches. And I'm talking about hundreds of churches that they oversee. And they were asking us these questions, well, how did you, you do during COVID? And I said, well, what do you mean? Well, you know, we had church, churches shut down. We had the, and I said, no, no, no. We grew about 400%. We didn't lose anybody. We grew in a time which was engineered to shut down churches. Why? Because we only preach the truth. We don't get into fads and we don't follow all these kind of things. We actually, um, one person told me the other day, they said, you know, the thing is, they said, do this because you've, you've become a trendsetter. People are listening and they're doing and they're following the things you're doing. And, the, and so we were talking about different things going on in the church. And then we had, you know, some people write us when I was over there. They got really upset because I wore a suit and tie. <laughs> One person wrote, get rid of the tie and lose the tie. Don't, don't bow to their pressure. No, no, no. I was in another man's house. You understand? I was in another man's house. This is how they did things. So guess what? I become all things to all men. Whatever I need to do that I might win some that I can get this message into. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to go into sin or I'll compromise. I don't mean that at all. I did not compromise. But I honored the person. I honored them at their house. And guess what? Their house changed. And now we have impact that is far beyond what we had before. Why? And I didn't just do it out of just lip service. In my heart, we honored the man 
and we honored his position on that thing. And, you know, it wasn't comfortable, but so what? Why? We're to be called, we are called to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ, right? And wearing a tie, I really can't consider that enduring hardness, okay? <laughs> I told them when they were talking about it, and I'm like, you know, I can't even consider this a mission trip. I said, because there's no mission trip when, that you actually go and gain weight. You're, you're, you're supposed to lose weight on mission trips. And so you can come back and talk about how you suffered for Jesus. I wasn't suffering. Amen? I, Nando's and Mug and Bean, we were there every day. Okay? I mean, it was good. Okay? <laughs> then we found another place called Casabella, which it was good too. So I, we were not suffering. All right? I'm just telling you. <laughs> so... But we, we, because we were able to step into these things and, and honor the people and honor, and we were in different houses. Let me put you, what I mean by houses, I'm talking about organizations. We were in with three main major organizations, I would say. And we recognized and we went in to help. We didn't go into control or, or that kind of stuff. We went in to help and to grow. And the effect, you watch, it'll be seen because we're already seeing it. And if you know what to watch for, you can see the changes. And it is amazing. And so there we go with amazing again. I'm telling you, it's the word of the day. So anyway, let's keep going. He says here, uh, let's see, yeah, hold fast. Yep, uh, let me go now. Verse 14, that good thing which was committed in the keep by the Holy Ghost which dwells in us. This you know, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phagellus and Hermogenes. Now, get this. He said, this is what's going on. He said, you stand fast, do what you need. He said, yeah, there's people that left. Yeah, there's these things going on. Yeah, this stuff going on. And he said, but, he said, you hold fast the form of sound words. Listen, it's going to cost you if you're going to stand for principle and stand according to the word of God. Just get ready for it. It's going to cost you because the devil will try to do a probing attack and see where you will compromise. And where, listen, you have to understand what we do, we don't compromise. But we will be able to impact people's lives. And there are certain uh, cultural things that you can go along with. And it's not a compromise, but it shows heart. Amen? Because that's the main thing. You have to love the people enough to do what you need to do to get to them. All right? Now, in Hebrews chapter 3, because what are we talking about this morning? We're talking about what is your testimony. And I'm not telling you to sit down and figure your three or four minute testimony of your life story. You should do that anyway. You should have that ready to share with somebody because the Bible tells us to have an answer ready for any man that asks us of the hope that dwells in us or abides in us. So you ought to have your, your story in two or three minutes. You ought to be able to tell your whole story, who you were, how Jesus delivered you, what you are now. You ought to be able to go through that and just explain it to them. And you're not going to be able to go too far but it might give them hope because you ought to always include, and what he did for me, he'll do for you. Why? Because you have that testimony of what God has done for you. Now, he says in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 3, for this man, Jesus, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house. Well, what was Moses' house? Judaism, right? The old covenant, as we would call it. Moses verily was faithful in all his house, and notice, as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. Now think about this. He lived a life as a servant over, now notice, he was over a house. That's what it says right there. He was faithful in all his house, but he was put over a house. But he was a servant of that house. See, that's the other thing the church has to get a hold of. The ministry are not the little popes. The ministry are under the house to lift the house up. Amen? To educate, to train, to equip. They're, they're not, man... <laughs> You watch some of the stuff that goes on in South Africa and all across Africa. It's ridiculous. We've, we've got, seen videos of preachers supposedly preaching the gospel that 
their followers carry them in on a chair. I mean, it looks like something out of Ten Commandments when Pharaoh was brought in. And when they set them down, their followers have to lie down on the grass and the man of God, and I use that term very loosely, walks on their backs to get to the platform because his feet can't touch the ground. That's the kind of stuff that's being perpetuated as the gospel. And that's why people see ministry as something to climb the ranks and to go up and it's a place to achieve. Let me tell you, ministry is a place, how you get into ministry is die. That's how you get into it. And you die for the people you serve so that whenever they have need, you're ready. That's what ministry is. Ministry is not your name on a card. It's not what you're entitled to, special benefits or whatever. You know, when we go places, yes, people treat us good, usually. Okay? There have been a few times, right? (laughs) But the idea is that as as a minister, it's not how high you can climb. It's how low you can bow. It's how much you can die because until you die, you're of no use. The the kernel of wheat has to go into the ground and die before it can produce fruit. Other than that, you're just reproducing yourself. If you haven't died, you'll only reproduce yourself. And that's a scary thing because the last thing the world needs is more of you or me. Amen? It needs more of Jesus. And the only way the world can see him is if we die and, and pull off these outer things of us so that only he is seen. Amen? Amen. We've got to turn this thing around. We've got to turn the gospel back to the gospel. We've got to be preaching the gospel and not be preaching a self-help, motivational, inspirational type sermon or speech or lecture and actually go back to the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the gospel of the kingdom, which includes dominion and authority for a purpose to help others, and to expand God's kingdom. That's why we're here. Amen? Not, so, not for what we can achieve or attain. That's been the problem. And so we've got to move away from that, and we've got to work toward actually helping people become like Christ, who was in the form of God, but took on the form of a servant. Amen? Now, I, we used to go to a Pentecostal church of God, and I, they're the only ones that still do it, I guess, but we used to have foot washings every now and then. And I'll be honest, I'm leaning back toward that. Why? Because ain't nothing kill flesh faster than a foot washing. (laughs) Amen. So I'm just telling you, just be ready. Amen. So before you come to church next Sunday, have mercy on the foot washers. Okay. Okay. Be ready for it. Amen. Okay, now, what he says here, for a, now this part I want to get to too, because he says here, he did these things. He was, now get this, he was faithful in all of his house. Why? Because of the things that he did would be a testimony that would be spoken of after. See, you have to realize your testimony isn't just what you're not, not it's not just your life. It is your life, not just your life. And it's not even just your words. It's going to be what people say about you when you're gone. Whenever they talk about you, and I'm not talking about dying necessarily. It might be. But when you're not around, how do they talk about you? What's your testimony? What do people say about you when you're not around? Well, because we have to be examples so that people know how we live and they see how we live and they, they see these things and they go, well, you know, because I'm telling you, there are, People, few, there's few, there's precious few. But there are people that when I'm around them and because I know them, they make me want to be more like Christ. Why? Because I see Christ in them. You know, one was a friend of mine that passed away back in 2014. He was from South Africa also. And in that man, I saw more than any. I mean, he had miracles. He had like, Almost every Sunday, well, not, not that much, but very regularly, I've got video of him raising the dead in his church while, while he's preaching. Somebody dies. That's the kind of people that came to his church. And they would die. And they would, somebody would wave and they'd say, this person quit breathing. He'd, 
He had just kind of keep preaching and walk over, had his hand in his pocket, just walked over and stand there and commanded life and, and the person would come back and he'd just keep on preaching. I mean, just, I mean, yet you would never guess it. He was so relaxed. But the, you know what stood out most to me about him? Because he had miracles all the time. Guess what? We see miracles. So that didn't stand out to me. What stood out to me was his generosity. The way he lived, the way nothing stuck to him. And, and, one, and over there, they bring the offering up and they throw it on the floor. They bring it up and they just toss it on the floor and they sweep it up and put it in a basket. That's how they do it. And they have like five, 6,000 people regularly doing that. And we were sitting on the front row and a person comes up during that and instead of tossing their offering, they had a Rolex watch and gave it to him. And he's, bless you, brother. And takes it's a Rolex watch. He looks and goes, Hands it over to me and says, you can have that. I've got five. <laughs> Come on, because people just give it to him. But he gives stuff away. He gave away 18 vans, vehicles, to ministries to help them get out and get the gospel out. He was just so, just free. And, and when I saw that, I, I started telling him, I want to be that way. That's how I want to be. I see, I see Jesus in that way, because nothing stuck to him. And he didn't care. And, and the funny thing was, his finances grew, and, and, but you couldn't tell it other than if you heard what he was doing. But he didn't, he didn't talk about it. Other people talked about it. It was amazing to watch him. And I told God, I said, I want to I be like that. That's, I want that freedom like that. And he's doing that in me. Why? Because there's a freedom where you don't have to think about anything. You, just, you can just love people and do the gospel. There's... There's nothing like that. I'm telling you, there's nothing else like it. You, you, you want that. And, and it gets... You just get to see Jesus. And you're free to be him. And then you look, at, you look back at what he's done. And it's not based on how much money you have or anything else. Many times, well, <clears throat> he wants to live his life through you. And that's part of his life. Why? Because he thought about people. He didn't think about stuff. He didn't think about things. You know, we go places and people give me things. And, and I, many times, I mean, there's, there's a weight limit to the what you can carry back in suitcases and that kind of stuff. And, and you know, thank you, but we're going to leave this here in Africa. You know, why? We, we appreciate it, but I can't carry this stuff back. But it's amazing what God will do when you just don't care. And all you do care about is the gospel and people and seeing them live it out. It's, man, he will do things through you that you, later you get to look back and go, wow. And then you realize that it's exactly what he tells us in Matthew 6, 33. That if you seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, all this other stuff will come. But if you seek the stuff, then you're acting like a heathen that doesn't even have a God. Because you've got to go get the stuff yourself, and you'll never have enough. But when God is your God, he'll take care of all your stuff. He'll take care of your needs. And, and you even get to see your wants come to pass. And the ones that, he, that, he, that you get to seek in the past, they're not stuff. It's what he gets to do through you. See, that's, we've we, we got to get back to real Christianity. Because it's not about sitting and listening to a sermon, to be honest with you. It's about living a life of freedom. Freedom from fear, freedom from lack, freedom from, and freedom from the fear of lack. But it's free, knowing that you can meet the needs of others. Why? Because all your needs are met. And if that person needs healing, guess what? You take on their need. God, I need healing for that person. I'll meet your need. And he supplies the healing. He supplies the power. It's all there. But you just, you got to get away from this, the, the religious thing of trying to, listen, <laughs> you can't play God. What I mean by that is he knows your plans. He knows if you're faking it. He knows if you're playing him. You know what I mean? It's amazing. You talk to people on the street sometimes that are 
you know, con artist. And, and it's funny because you look at and God will tell you that they're playing you. And you know they're playing you. You know, and they, and, but they got a good spiel. I mean, they've worked it out and it's worked. And, and you're listening to them and you're kind of, yeah, that's, wow, you've, you've spent some time on this story. You know, you just kind and, and and I said, listen, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna give you you don't don't I don't you don't have to play me. I'm gonna help you, just because you ask. I'm gonna help because and then I tell him because God told me to give to any man that asks. So I'm I'm gonna give you something, but it's not because I, you gave me a better story. It's just because you ask, and then they kind of don't know whether to run or what. You know they. Because they don't want to run before you give them something. You know? so they're kind of like, okay, go ahead, you know, help. But you can't, you can't play God either. He knows. You know? And if, you, if you're going to worship because you want something, it's not worship. It's not worship. It's only worship when you come to give something. And in the giving, guess what? You can't outgive God. But you don't give to get from God. Amen? You, maybe you give because you got, but you don't give to get. Does that make sense? Now, I, listen, I believe so in reaping. I know all that's true. But I'm saying when you're worshiping God, come on, let it be pure. Let it be but what he is. Amen? Not about, oh, God, you make me feel good. See, that's what a lot of our worship goes to. I'm going to worship until I feel good. That ain't worship. You know, you may be standing somewhere where, you know, we'd say God's rain is falling, but it ain't worship. You know, that's the amazing thing with God. Wow, he is so good. You know, if it rains, all you got to do is get out in it. Anybody can walk out in the rain anytime they want. With God, you can walk into all he's got anytime you want. You can walk right into it. Why? Because he's not saying, you, you, oh, no, I'm going to stop the rain over you. No, it's not going to fall on you. No, he said, no, you draw nigh to me, and I'll draw nigh to you. We just read that. Amen? But we've got to get away from the religious idea of where we're trying to create a God. Well, this is what he's like. This is, we've got to put him here. We've got to put him, and it's going to do this. No. Well, God won't do that until you do that. He won't do that until the, and see, a lot of times we make those rules. God didn't say it. We were, my wife and I were talking last night about how God uses people and, you know, many times it's, the only reason he uses them is because they're all he's got. And he cares so much about this other person, he'll even use that person to help them. Yeah, yeah I know, I've been in that boat, right? But he loves people. And real freedom comes when you start loving people. Because then he'll pour himself through you just to touch him. It's amazing. But if you try to use him to get somewhere, oh, let me tell you, he can see right through that. And he knows it. And it's going to be a rough road. It's going to be rough. Why? Because he, he doesn't play like that. With him, this stuff is real. It's not even church. It's life, you know? When we're all gone from here and all this stuff, guess what? The life we have in us is going to keep on going on. So what life is that? Well, that's your testimony. That's what it all comes back to. So I do want to get through this. But he's, notice, again, Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. He knew. See, he... He knew his life was going to be a life of example. In some cases, not good. In other cases, good. Just like David. Some cases, not good. Some cases, good. Be it, be it, you're going to be an example. Just like with Samson. But know that your life is being written down. But your testimony is what you're saying about God. It's what you believe about God. It's how you live your life with God. That's your testimony. Your testimony is your life. It's not just your past life. You know, this is what I was saved from. Okay, that's great. But what are you saved to? It's not just what you're saved from. Some people don't know what they're saved from or what they're saved to. Why? Because you can't even tell if they were saved from anything. Why? Because their life hadn't changed. 
Still got to, and even if they're not doing the same things, they still got some of the same fears and worries and all that kind of stuff. And let me tell you, God wants you to, he wants your testimony about him to be, I was hurting, I was in this place, and God. And when God came, I wasn't in that place no more. See, we got to get away from the idea of just faking it. You can't just fake it. We're talking about your eternal destiny. We're talking about your life, not just in the future, but also here too. But we can't just put on a church face and go home, you know, and in here sing and shout and go home and cry. He wants our lives to be the same, just like his, yesterday, today, and forever, just the same. And guess what same that is? Good, good life, amen? He wants you to choose life and blessing, not death and cursing, not, oh, this is bad. No, no. Now, I'm not saying you, that, I'm not saying you're not going to have problems. I'm not saying that you're not going to have these things going on. But you've got to realize, when, whenever you walk, <laughs> man, when you walk as close with God as he wants you to, you'll be so enamored with him that even the storms and the stuff that come, you won't even notice. I mean, think about this. If you go back and look at what it says about Peter, whenever they were, when Jesus was walking on the water, they saw him. There was a storm. There was a storm going on. That's why it was hard for them to see him. Storm, all this stuff going on. Think about that. And they see Jesus in the middle, the rain. Jesus was soaking wet, walking on the water, the wind, his robe, and all that stuff blowing in the wind and all that. And they're, they're walking, they're, they're in the boat, and they see him walking up. And they thought it was a ghost. And he said, no, don't be afraid. It's me. Lord, if it's you, if it's you, Tell me to come. What's he going to do? He's got to tell him to come. It's him. So he says, come. And now Peter's seeing him. He, you know, Peter could have said, Lord, if it's really you, stop this storm. But he didn't say that. He said, if it's you, call me. Call me to walk in the storm with the rain, with the wind, with all this, with the waves and all that. And you notice none of that mattered to him. He didn't even pay attention to it. And then he gets out of the boat and he's walking on in stormy weather, waves, wind, storm, all this going on. And then for some reason, he looked at the wind and the waves instead of Jesus. It was like the first time he saw it. You know, there's no mention of Peter looking at the wind and the waves or noticing there's even a storm until it says he looked at the wind, you know, and the waves. In other words, he was so focused on Jesus that he didn't even think anything about the storm. Really, Jesus, you're going to ask me to get out of a boat in a storm? I wouldn't want to get out of a boat if there wasn't a storm. <laughs> think about it. You know, if, if, the, if the water was solid, you know, I mean, a solid sheet, and just smooth, you know, like looking at a swimming pool. Yeah, oh, look, it's smooth. I must be able to walk on it. No. No, look at the waves. Let's, let's put a wave pool out there. Oh, yeah, oh, now I can walk on it. Yeah, because that's couldn't walk on it when it was smooth, but no. But when he quit looking at Jesus, he became fearful. Why? Fearful of what? The wind and the waves? Listen, it ain't the wind and the waves that was going to do him in. It was the water he was fixing to dump into. Does that make sense? I mean, think about that. It wasn't like a wave was going to take him out or the wind was going to kill him. He was fixing to drown. He was going to go on. He, that's what he should have been talking. Jesus, do something here. But when he got his eyes off of Jesus, then he started to sink. Why? Because he became fearful. And he was, he was apparently within arm's reach of Jesus. Think about that. He started getting close to him and started noticing and then he started to sink. And Jesus immediately grabbed it and lifted him up. Think about that. Then they still had to walk back to the boat and climb over in the boat. Can you imagine that? I'm sure he was sitting there later going, what did I just do? Whoa. You see, the wind and the waves and all that stuff, it's, it's amazing because you can, I want to be careful how I say this, but you can judge your walk with what you're looking at. 
you know, and because and, and, everybody's got storms. Different things happen, go on. But it, when you walk close with him and your eyes are on him, the storm and stuff really doesn't get your attention. What, what do you think about that? Oh, the stock market's going to do this. Guess what? If the stock market tanks, won't affect me one bit. Why? Ain't got no stock. <laughs> Ain't got to worry about it. Isn't that amazing? I, you know, I just don't worry about that stuff. <laughs> you know? But you, you just walk with him. And if you do, guess what? Yeah, you're still going to have storms. But you won't notice them. And then when you walk through the storm, I'm not saying you're not going to notice them at all. I mean, you can know things are going on, but you're just like, yeah, you know, I, I, maybe I should be worried, but I'm just not. You know, and people look at you like, you're just, you're just crazy. Well, leave me alone. It's working for me. Amen? You call me crazy, but you're the one sitting there, what are we going to do? You know? I mean, come on. Let's just live in peace and walk with God and, and do what he said to do. Amen? He's not telling you to do things because he wants to make your life rough. He's telling you where to step because he doesn't want you stepping on a landmine. He's telling you to follow his footpath, follow his pattern, his example. Why? Because it'll keep that stuff. You can walk in a place where the enemy cannot touch you. Recently, we, you know, I've been all over the world. I've, I've been in some rough places, and crazy things have happened. And I've, I've touched every kind of disease you can imagine. With these hands, I've, my, these physical hands, I've touched every type of disease. Contagious I mean, horrible stuff. I mean, I've had goo on my hands that was coming out of people's body and never caught it. Why? Decided not to. Why? To catch it, you got to, I don't want to catch. Amen? And then, but then I, I hear about people went to the same places I've gone did some of the same stuff. And then they come back to the States and they're in the hospital for a month. Almost die. I mean, at the point of death. Why? It wouldn't, it wouldn't have mattered. They believed. They saw healings. But their eyes were more on what empire they could build rather than what kingdom they're supposed to be building. We've got to get our minds away from all that stuff. And I know many of you, you're not thinking in terms like, I, I get that. But you also got to realize, I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking to people around the world. Right now, people around the world. People get up at 2 o'clock in the morning to watch this broadcast. Why? Because we're, they tell us. We know you'll tell us the truth, even if it doesn't feel good. We were talking about that when I was in Africa. It's like, you know what? So funny. One person came to me and go, you know what? That didn't even feel like a spanking. <laughs> I'm like, well, make no mistake, it was. Okay? <laughs> but, well, they, they, they said, because we know, we know you love us. Why? Well, because I want... I want I don't go over there to be the great white heater. I want to I go over there to help work myself out of a job, you know? I want other people to do this. Man, I can't wait to we see a, an army just going door to door and just driving the devil out of town, you know? And instead of us having to stand on the street and going I, wore, I dust the very dust of your streets off my... See, Jesus talked about us doing that. But let me tell you, there's a time whenever you can get done and go, there you go, devil, and, I, and don't come back. And you're standing at the city limits where you just ran him out of town. You can live a life like that. He says in verse 6, but Christ, as a son over his own house. Now notice, Moses as a servant 
over all his house, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. Now remember that, whose house we are. Because you know, don't go look at this now because we ain't got time. But in Matthew chapter, or I'm sorry, Mark chapter 13 and verse 34, I've actually talked about this before. It says that the Son of Man is like a man taking a, a husband, a, a, a householder, going on a long journey and leaving his house. Well, guess what? We're his house. But it says he left his things, his goods, his authority. That's what Jesus did in Matthew 28. He left us his authority, his house. And he left it for us to do what he did. He says here, but Christ is a son over his own house. Whose house are we? If we, if, now we're his house, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. You hear that? The confidence and the rejoicing unto the end. Now Jesus said, he that endures to the end. So we know from now to the end, there's going to be some enduring. But here it says there's going to be rejoicing. So which is it, enduring or rejoicing? Yeah, that's how you endure. You rejoice. What? When? Whenever you find yourself in when? Trials, temptations, count it all joy. Like I said before, I've I hardly ever, I've never had somebody come to me and say, oh, Brother Curry, man, I'm telling you what, I'm so happy. You would not believe I don't know why I start talking about Bill Clinton with Seth and with him. I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but I've never had him come and tell me how happy they were that they were going through trials and tribulations. And yet he says, count it all joy when you find it. Why? Because you know, yes, you have to understand, you, you can cast your cares. Okay. The, it's not just the weight and the, well, it's not just sin, it's the weight and the sin. What are the cares? That's those distractions. Cast those distractions on him. Tell him, God, I don't like that distraction. I know I like it, but I don't like it. So do something with it, right? Help me hate it. Why? Because it's, listen, it's generally not the big sins that do people in. Biggest killer of Christians is not just some big sin. It's usually boredom. Because the boredom leads to sin. That's what usually takes Christians out. They get bored and they need entertainment. They need amusements. And they start wasting time whenever he tells us to redeem the time because the day is evil. Listen, beloved, I'm not talking about some legalistic thing. You got to do this, this, this. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a lifestyle that is freedom. And it's a simple life. And it's not getting entangled in all the affairs of life. Simplicity. He says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. You notice every time you hear his voice, if you don't obey, you harden your heart. Every time. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Isn't that amazing? He said that. He quoted, he said, uh, they, that, that they grieved his heart because they didn't know his ways. And just the other day, I heard a preacher say, I'm not, well, I really want to mention his name, but I'm not because I could not believe this person could say something so stupid and, the, and yet have thousands of people up cheering. But here he said, they didn't, the reason they grieved his heart was because they didn't know his ways. And what you hear from preachers, his thoughts, you know, our thoughts are not his thoughts. His ways are not our ways. Yeah, if you're wicked and unrighteous, according to Isaiah. But to us, he tells us these things have been revealed to us. So that's not, that's not who we are. His ways are our ways. What is his ways? His ways are ways of righteousness, of love, of peace. That's his ways. 
If that's not your way, then you don't know him and you're not walking with him, no matter what you call yourself. Because it's not the tag. It's the life. That's what counts. He says, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Now watch, in departing from the living, departing from the living God. So an evil heart of unbelief can cause you to depart from the living God. Now you, you get that, depart from the living God. I mean, that, you've got to realize you can depart from the living God. How? By having in your heart unbelief. You can depart. You can know him and walk with him. And then because of unbelief, because of fear, because of things going on, you can depart from him. He didn't say he'd kick you out. He didn't say he'd leave you. He said, you left. You leave. He didn't say he would hold you against your will. He says, but it, instead, now watch this, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. But if there has ever been a time when the church has accepted sin as part of their lifestyle, it is today. I can't believe some of the things that I see on Christian television that they portray as Christianity. The stuff that's going on, is, it's ridiculous now. And now it's not just the world calling good evil and evil good. It's the church. Just recently, actually we saw it on the video. I don't know if, maybe I, can, I don't know the details. I'd have to get it, but I saw it. I saw it in my own eyes. I know it's real. There was a Lutheran church in Minnesota that was ridiculous. They gave what they called the sparkle liturgy. It is, ah, it, I, there are no words. And, and it's not that I get mad. I'm not mad. It breaks my heart. So you see people that are absolutely caught in deception, and they think that they're free. And they think that, oh, oh, we're more free. Why? Because we're accepting of any lifestyle, anything. And they think that's freedom. But even Paul talked about it. He said, you know, don't, don't let your liberty be used as license to sin. There are limits. There are lines to be drawn. And the day is coming. And it's not far off. We're, I'm telling you, we're already seeing the dawning of that day when the church, there will be a splitting, a parting of the ways of the church, and the, there's going to be those that want to go the way of the world, and they're going to fit in with the world, and they're going to do everything with it, and they're still going to call themselves Christians, and they're still going to have a form of godliness, but deny the power. You say, well, how are they denying the power? They're denying the power that God can still destroy the wicked. There's a movement on right now called Taking Back the Rainbow. And they're setting things up. But let me tell you, God didn't... Man. You can't take a promise of God of how he would not destroy the world again and use that as a fist in his face to say, we will live any kind of life we want and you're not going to do anything about it. That is not what the rainbow was for. And you have to remember, all he said was, I will never destroy the world again with water. <laughs> That's, he did not say he wouldn't destroy it. Amen? Matter of fact, you read Peter and it talks about fervent fire and everything being rolled up and I'm telling you. But we have to realize these, these are people that they're speaking for God and lying and deceiving people. 
That, what does that mean? That means that our voice of truth has to be louder, has to be stronger, but it also has to be built on a foundation that people are not going to walk around behind you and look at your life and go, oh, yeah, you're saying one thing, but you're living something else. You just don't practice the same sin. You see, that's what we do. Well, you know, oh, yeah, I sin, but it's not as bad as their sin. Really, how much light do you think they have? And how much light do you have? Because they could have less light and be less guilty. Because the more light we have, the more we should walk right. Amen? So I'm not blasting them. I'm, I'm not, it, it's sad. It hurt it to, to watch that and to think, how can people move so far from the truth and still think it's truth? But, but he says here that we're to exhort one another daily. Then in Hebrews 11.5, what are we talking about? Your testimony. Your testimony. Listen, you have to realize your testimony is what you say about God. It's what, how you live about God. It's, what, it's, it's everything about your life. Hebrews 11.5, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. Now watch this. For before his translation, he had this testimony. You hear that? Before he was translated, he had this testimony. What? That he pleased God. You know what that means? He walked by faith. Why? Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. So he had to walk by faith, and by faith, and get this, God translated him because he pleased God. But he had that testimony before he was translated. He didn't wait till he got translated. Where did he get translated to? He went to heaven. See, he didn't wait. He didn't say, well, when I get to heaven... I'll be good then. I'll be perfect. I'll be made holy. He didn't say. He had the testimony beforehand that he pleased God. He walked by faith. What does that mean? That means that we can't look to heaven and go, well, you know what? I'll be a sinner till I get to heaven. Then God will fix me. There ain't going to be no sinners in heaven. We don't get there by being a sinner. Does that make sense? You have to live holy by faith. And, and, and by faith, you actually start believing what he has said, that he will keep what you have committed to him. And you start living, then, and it's amazing because he starts making it easier to live holy. And, and he'll tell you, don't do this. And it's not like, oh, but I want, no. No, you, you go, oh, yeah, thank you for telling me. Yeah, I didn't realize that you didn't like that. He'll do that for you. You know, he'll say, turn that stupid thing off. Don't watch that stuff. Well, I don't really watch stuff. I mean, you know, all I watch is the news. <laughs> really. Yeah, the stuff that's geared to make you hate your brother. That's what you're watching. That says, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. That's that's. What you want? You know, I got to keep up with what's going on. No, if it's important enough, it'll get to you. Amen. Or maybe you can actually be like the Israelites and have all the stuff going on in Egypt, but not in Goshen, not in your house. Amen. Right. Why? Because a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it won't come near your house. Imagine that. Imagine stuff. Imagine. Okay. <laughs> Imagine going through COVID and never knowing it had come. That's called being Amish. <laughs> Come on. They had no problems with COVID. Yes, Amen? Why? Because they didn't have TVs. <laughs> didn't have a TV, didn't have COVID. It's pretty much the way it worked. Just saying. Okay. Anyway. Revelation chapter 12. Almost done. Yep, almost done. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. 
He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Notice, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Okay, that's been done. And by the word of their testimony. So what is it, your word, the word of your testimony? Is it talking about, well, this is what I used to be and here's what I am? No. It's what are you saying about God now? The word of your testimony. Here's what's going on. Now notice, that's, it's also in, in the context of even accusing. You're being accused? What's the word of your testimony? What does his word say? No weapon formed against me will prosper. Every tongue that rises up will he put down. Why? Because my righteousness is of the Lord. Amen? You don't have to defend yourself. Why? He's, you've got one that will defend you. Your job is to make sure your life, okay, if you're going to suffer evil, don't do it as an evildoer. You understand what I mean by that? If, the, if you're going to suffer bad things, don't do it because you've done bad things. Let them say bad things about you because you've been living right. That's what I'm saying. He said, therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and read this, but I'm just going to read it, okay? I'm going to read it quickly. I know, I, you know we're actually doing pretty good, I guess. But In Matthew 25, it says, Verse 1, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so. Ain't going to happen. Lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. Now, I'm going to try to keep reading as quick as I can here. But understand... You don't know the day or the hour when the Son of Man comes, but I'll guarantee you this, He's coming. And His coming is sooner than it used to be. Now that just follows, obviously. But at the same time, we have to realize we can't be foolish. Amen? We have to be the wise that has oil in our lamps. And I know there's been all kinds of people preaching all kinds of stuff about this and making the five this and the five that and this kind of thing means this and if you have oil, it means you have the Holy Ghost. And if you don't have the Holy Ghost speaking tongues, you don't have oil. And you, I, I've, I've heard it all, okay? I'm not even commenting on that stuff, right? All I'm saying is get what he's trying to get across here. He's just saying, listen, live ready. Be ready while you can. Why? Because when the time comes and you need it and you look at it and you don't have it, he's gonna, you're going to try to get it from somebody else and they're going to say, nope, go get your own. And guess what? While you're getting your own, he's going to come and you're going to miss him. That's what he's saying. Do you get that? I'm not saying all the conditions are and all that, you know, at this point. But he said, watch, therefore, for you know not near the day or the hour when the Son of Man comes. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country. Remember, I just mentioned Mark 13. This is similar. Who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, that's like bars of gold, we would say, okay? To another two, and to another one. 
to every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey. Now notice, according to every man according to his several ability. In other words, God knows what you can handle and he gives you what you can handle. And now, but he expects you to make profit off of what he gave you, right? And you'll, well, you'll see. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. I may need batteries. I don't know what that sound is. We spent a lot of money on this sound system. Let's make it work. <clears throat> but he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, you delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of your Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered unto me two talents. Behold, I've gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Notice he said the same thing to the man that made two extra talents as he said to the man that made five. So it's not how much you make, but notice there, each one of them is making 100%. You get that? So it's not based on how much you started with. He says, then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that you're a hard man, reaping where you have not sown. Oh, well, he's sown one, right? And gathering where you've not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent, hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. In other words, I didn't lose it. His Lord answered and said unto him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. You oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers and then at my coming I should have received my own with interest. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which has ten talents. For unto everyone that hath shall be given, he, that, he shall have abundance. But from he that hath not shall be taken away from him even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant. Unprofitable servant. You got me a mic? Okay. Y'all want this? Here we go. Now it's on. There we go. All right. Now, you ought to be in South Africa where the power goes out in the middle of your preaching. Everybody just has to sit in the dark till the generators kick on. Didn't stop me. Kept preaching. Okay. Now, he says here, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, well, let me go back, sorry. Uh, he says in verse 30, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Unprofitable servant. You get that? Unprofitable is not keeping what you started with, it's making, being profitable. Being unprofitable is keeping what you started with, but not making more. Does that make sense? So what is that telling us? Jesus is looking for increase. He expects you to do something, even if you, well, I don't have much. I don't have this. I can, so what? That's got nothing to do with anything. He still, he still expects you to increase what he gave you. And increase only comes with exercise. In other words, you do it. Does this make sense? He says, now watch. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungered or fed thee or thirsty and gave you drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took you in or naked and clothed thee? Or when we when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? 
And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, you didn't visit me. Then shall they also answer and say, Lord, when do we see you hungry, or a thirst, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he say, then shall he answer them. Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Jesus said that. Now, if you're my generation, when I was reading that, you probably heard Keith Green. Because he had a song about that very thing called the sheep and the goat. That song changed my life. One of the first times I heard it, in 1980, we were living in Wiley, not far from here. I was working at the water plant. And that song came on on the radio while I was at work. Let me tell you, that's, you know, there were no lights where I was at. That's a scary song to listen to in the dark, especially the way he did the piano. Maybe one day. But notice what he said there. He gave two parables. And a parable is not something fictitious. It is to compare something to. And he said, this is the way the kingdom of heaven is going to be. He said, it's going to be foolish and wise virgins that slept, lumbered, and didn't know when their master was coming, when the king was coming. And the other one, right after that, he said, the king gave his servants his stuff. It doesn't really matter how much is given. He's going to expect increase. And one of the things that has been playing on me a lot lately is another parable he gave where he said that a man, a householder, went out early in the day saw men standing around and said, why do you stand here idle? They said, no one has hired us. He said, go to work. What is he saying? I'll hire you. Go to work. I'll pay you what is right. And then later on, he went out and saw more people standing. Why are you standing here? Nobody's hired us. I'll hire you. Go to work. And he did that about four different times, all the way through the day almost. And it's at the end of the day, he brought them all in, he started paying the last ones first and paid them the same amount that he paid the early workers. And the early workers got upset. He said, they didn't work as long as we did. And he said, what is that to you? I'm giving you what I promised. And I can do whatever I want with my goods. Now think about that. The amazing thing to me about that story, and I've heard it preached all kinds of ways, one thing I never heard anybody preach about was the fact that everybody got hired. Everybody. He never saw people standing around and said, you go and you stay. So we got no excuse. Like Keith Green even said one time, he said, we've been commanded to go. You don't need a leading to go. You need a special leading to stay. Why? Because he never said, just stay. But he told us to occupy be busy. And what do you tell us to do? Treat people like we would treat Jesus. If they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them to drink. Naked, clothe them. If they're sick, visit them, minister to them. What does that mean? Get them healed. If they're in prison, visit them. Why? Because whatever we do to them, we're doing for him. We can't say we love him if we don't touch lives that are hurting, 
that are all around us. Because the commandments are simple. Love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. Second, like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. Do for them what you would have done for you. On these two, all the law and the prophets. It's not enough to know. You got to do what he said. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, if you're wise, you'll build your house on a rock by doing his words. If you're foolish, it's amazing. He talked about wise and foolish people a whole lot. It was always up to the people to determine whether they were going to be wise or foolish. So, I know most people come to us for healing, physical healing usually. That's not all there is. Jesus didn't just go to the whipping post. He went to the cross. He was also in the garden, bled there. So this morning, I've taken some time here, Forgive me, I'm used to doing seminars a lot. For me, this is why? Because it's in a sermon to me. I would preach fifteen, eighteen hours, whatever it would take. I thought a person was minutes away from making a decision alter their life and their eternal day. No problem doing a filibuster. Why? Because I don't want to quit a minute before you give in and bow your knee to Jesus. Satan's a hard man. Jesus is wants to take the burden off your shoulders and pour them for you. Take your sickness and disease. He's already bore them. He wants to take your sin so you're not trapped, not in bondage. Because there's more to bondage of sin. There's the sin itself and there's the consequences. And then there's always the fear of somebody finding out. The fear of death, of reputation. The fear of letting people down. Including yourself, including God. So right now there's, you know, you may be hungry, maybe time to go eat. Maybe you need to get home because you had a, you know, like a crock pot or something going and you're afraid it's going to burn before I let you out of here. I don't know. But if you come here, you ought to know better than to start food at home. So, so, I'm, so I'm saying. That's all. <clears throat> but I'm not trying to get you some emotional state. Why? Because if you get saved or helped by emotion, when the feeling's gone, you go back to what you were. It's like being married or it's like you know, getting married out of pure emotion or joining the military off of a patriotic feeling. You know, you wake up the next morning and you realize you're in a different world. But you made commitments. But now I'm asking you to make a commitment. Maybe you've never known Jesus as your Lord. And if that's you, and my heart goes out to you because I know what your life must have been. But it doesn't have to stay that way. Maybe you have known him. But maybe you got entangled in the affairs of life. Maybe things, you just get busy with life. And maybe you've cooled off. You're not cold. You don't dislike him. You just don't have time for him. Well, that's called lukewarm. It's not a place you want to be. Or maybe you just say, you know, I'm not where I should be. 
but you want to get there. Any of these can change that quick. He's just waiting on you to make a decision. He's already made the decision. He made the decision when he said, I've got to go to Jerusalem so that I can be crucified. He made the decision to hang on a cross. He made the decision to allow himself to get whipped when he could have stopped it with one word. But he didn't because he knew you needed him. And it's just like the song, you were on his mind when he was on the cross. And if any of those fit you today, then I'm going to encourage you and invite you to come up front. Come right up here. And it's not you coming here that makes a difference. It's the decision you make to get up and get here. The minute you make that decision and act on it, it's done. And then as you come up, then we're going to rejoice with you. We're going to minister to you. We're going to set you free of whatever the enemy has lied to you about. But today can be that day. So if you fit any of those categories, then I'm going to say come now. But come quick. Because we're not going to let this last long. Because you're going to make a decision simple as that. Amen. 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 Come on. Amen. Amen. Any, anyone else? Come on. Come on quick. Don't let the devil talk you out of it. Don't let him talk you out of it. If you want to be free, now's the time. In any area. Anybody else? We appreciate you coming. We appreciate you recognizing where you want, where you are and where you want to be. So come quick. Right now. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come quick. There we go. Right now. Now, if you also came for healing, physical healing, then I'm going to ask you to go ahead and come on up front to My team will line you up behind them right in front of those chairs. Just come quick. Come quick. Amen. Everybody else, just stay kind of put right here. Hi. Hey. <laughs> now, as I said, you've already made the decision. The decision's been done. You, you, when you made the decision to come front, right then you were changed. And you know where it put you, whether you are introducing yourself to Jesus for the first time or whether you're coming back to him. I can tell you, I came back to him many times. I wish it was one time. He was a lot more faithful than I was. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for these lives dedicated to you, given to you, recognizing that your son is now their Lord and Savior. They want to walk with you. And even now, Father, we thank you that as they draw nigh to you, you have drawn nigh to them. That in the name of Jesus, on the authority of the word of Jesus Christ, I can tell you, your sins are forgiven. He has cleansed you, made you whole. And that if there was anything in your body that is, was wrong, not right, not working right, that at the moment you committed yourself to him, all that he did for you was applied to you. And that right now, you're saved, healed, and delivered. You've been translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. So right now, in the name of Jesus, I'm just going to ask you to just maybe say this with me. Father, you are my Father. 
I recognize Jesus as my Lord. And I will keep him as my Lord. All the days of my life. I commit myself to you, Father. And I know that you will keep what is committed to you. And I thank you. Even now. For the power of your spirit. To keep me. To guide me. To teach me. I want your ways. To be my ways. I want to think your thoughts. So Father I thank you. I receive all that you have for me. I receive your Holy Spirit. To fill me. To overflowing, to overflowing, to change me, to change me. That, I am that I am recreated in the likeness of your Son. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 We would like to stay connected with you and give you an opportunity to become a member, therefore allowing us to pray for your specific needs. You do not have to be here physically to join or be a member of our church, so you are welcome to join membership from wherever you are. There are three ways you can access our membership. You can download the JGLM app from the App Store and Google Play right on your phone. You can also go to dominionlifechurch.org and click on Join the Church. Third, you may fill out a physical membership form right here in our lobby at Dominion Life Church. If you're interested in becoming a certified divine healing technician, starting or joining a life team, please visit startlifeteams.com forward slash locate. There, you will also find links to our weekly get started calls and our Q&A calls. The get started calls are every Tuesday at 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time and the Q&A calls are every Thursday at 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. We wanted to inform you of several ways you can partner with us through giving. You can give online at jglm.org or dominionlifechurch.org and click on give. You can also give through the JGLM app or you can text to give by texting the keyword JGLM and the amount to 833-245-6345. If you want to give by check, please make it payable to JGLM or Dominion Life Church. 